Hello, folks. This is the Surly Grognards for July 30th, 2012. Uh, this is Peter Bowman. I'm joined, as usual, my my good friend and co-host, Eric Carlson. So how are you doing tonight, Eric? I'm doing all right. I've got tobacco, I've got bourbon, all is well with the world. Awesome. So tonight we're going to be talking about uh, pre-made adventures and campaign settings. Specifically, we'll be discussing the pros and cons of them from both the GM's and the player's point of view. Uh, if we have time, as usual, we'll be taking questions at the end of the show. Uh, you can either email them to this, our sh email address, surlygrognards at yahoo.com, or you can ask them in the chat here. So uh, why don't we start off, what do you want to talk about first, Eric? Do you want to talk about uh, adventures or campaigns, campaign worlds? Let's, uh, let's start with campaign worlds and move on to adventures. Yeah, I think that's a good, way, good place to start. So uh, start with move small. <laughs> sort of the opposite of how I like planning, sort of designing game worlds in many exactly. ways. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, what, yeah, we'll start off with uh, sort of yeah, the pros and cons of uh, campaign, the pre-made campaigns. Uh, we touched on this a little bit when we talked about uh, the generic versus specific uh, game game systems a couple of weeks, a couple of se se uh, episodes back, uh, more than a couple of weeks. But at any rate, um, but well, why don't we sort of go over? To, why don't we cover it again? So, um, so. What would you, Eric, from, from at least from the player's point of view, first off, uh, what would you say sort of some of the pro, pros are for a pre-designed campaign? Um, well, typically you have a huge amount of resources that you can go and just dive headlong into and make a, a character is tailor-made for that kind of universe, which um, which has, adds a, a layer of, of depth to the character all, to, all into itself. And um, it's, it's kind of cool to be able to, to read about the the political um, things and racial race relations and other wackiness of the world you're playing in. Yeah, it's it's th that's definitely a big plus for a player. Um, and for a game master, you know, you've got a host of material to draw ideas on for you know your own for your own adventures. You have uh, you know entire cities mapped out in big details. So you know everything about what can go on there. Um, and you know it's got NPCs up the wazoo if they're done right, um, or if they're if not. I shouldn't say done right, but if they're if they're big and well established. Um, the newer ones won't have quite as much detail, obviously, for obvious reasons. Um, uh, another advantage I just thought of is that there's a huge host of information out there that you don't have to do any work to go through because it's all been put together by like 30 different people. Yeah, exactly. It's it's a gigantic time saver for the game master. Um, because you don't have to write your own game world. Um, you know, you can spend that time on, you know, prepping the adventures and, you know, just sort of planning out what you want to have happen. Um, and that's, uh, as I said, it's a big time saver. Um, also, I mean, for people who don't, who aren't as big into the world creation thing, it mm. means that they don't have to spend their time doing that. I mean, it's, again, time saver. It's not just a time saver. It's a... It takes a load off of the game master, is the thing. So I mean, it, the game master doesn't have to worry about designing the world and having to come up with important sort of world background details on their own. Um, and it tends to it tends to make things a bit more consistent, also. Uh, you know, because it's less likely you're, do that. you're not less likely to forget details, and if you do, you can just refer back to the books. Um, and as I said, when I when I say pre-made camp, uh, campaign worlds and adventures, I'm pretty mostly talking about the ones that you can go out and buy. Uh, it's not just, and it's not. It's usually they're usually for the campaign worlds. They're usually tied into a particular system, but there are a few that are just like published um, game worlds that are aren't like you know part of the actual like buying the basic rules. Um, and, There's inevitably a GURP supplement that do, that covers that game world. Yeah, pretty much. Go. Oh. <laughs> That's one of GURPS' greatest strengths is their setting books, where they basically, you know, they'll take an established work of fiction uh, and uh, create a campaign setting for it mm. uh, that you could use in GURPS. GURPS has, I would guess, hundreds of them at this point. <laughs> usually. Um, and they usually do a really good job of researching and writing them up. Uh, but, you know, you can find them for a bunch of different game settings. I mean, D&D has got a host of different game, official campaign worlds. Uh, you know, from like in fourth edition, you know, you've got Forgotten Realms, you've got Dark Sun, you've got Eberron. Uh, oh, that's right, Dark Sun came back for fourth edition. It did indeed. Um, and you know, Paizo's got their own campaign world tied that they've tied into their uh, system for Pathfinder. Uh, you know, you've talked about Shadowrun in the past, and that's its own game world right there. That's its own game world. Um, Cyberpunk 2020 is its own game world. Yep. 
you, the the host of World of Darkness games that White Wolf puts out are all linked in the same game world. Yep. Uh, and they have hosts of books to, to fill in details on the game world. Um, and, you know, this is, it's actually, as we said, it's, as I said, it's very handy and it's a big time saver. Um, and if you're, like, and if you're not, as I said, if you're not big into building game worlds, but you want to write your own adventures, you've got huge amounts of details to pull ideas out of. And they often have little, camp, like, you know, adventure ideas in, in the books. Like little, like, two-sentence like, ideas that you could build an entire adventure off of, or heck, an entire campaign off of. Yeah, it's not uncommon to have, like, 100 adventure ideas in there. I mean, and literally listed as 100 different adventure ideas. Right. Like, <laughs> one or two uh, sentences. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, there, uh, there are a host of different campaign worlds out there for almost every system in existence. Um, so it's a good place, to, especially for a newer game master, it's a good place to start. Um, you don't have to spend your time thinking about your campaign world. You can just pick one up and build from there, which is a big help. Now, going from that, you know, there's also, there are also cons to playing, playing in a pre, pre, you know, a pre-made campaign world. Um, they can be, they, it can be limiting sometimes. Yep. Um, for example, there is absolutely no way if you're, say, playing, uh, I don't know, the uh, the 40k RPG systems. There's no way you're going to get an orc and a space marine to work together. Right. It's not going to happen. Right. But uh, if you're running your own game world that had s- space marine analog and space orc analog, they'll work together. If you want if them you to. If you so choose it. Exactly. Um, also, you know, it the pre-established game worlds might not work for what the, the type of campaign you would like to run story-wise. Mm. Um, there are games where, uh, you know, game worlds that, you know, you, that certain story types don't work well in, um, you know, like, uh, see if I can think of a good example here. Um, well, you could sort of start with, you know, (laughs) the super is game in cyberpunk 2020. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, yeah, pretty much. I mean, you could sort of do it, but it won't really work. Um, but I'm not even really talking about that. I'm talking about story concepts really. Um, you know, like, um, murder mysteries don't work in every game world particularly well. I mean, they work better in most because it's a fairly generic thing. But, uh, actually, a better example is sort of your, your traditional sort of high fantasy, uh... Good versus evil, sword and sorcery type of Yeah, deal. that's not going to work as well in cert- some fantasy worlds as it does in others. Um, it won't work as well, say, in uh, Ravenloft, which is basically True. fantasy horror. So I mean, you're the the sort of it, it. You can make it work, but it's gonna feel weird because the Ravenloft is designed for something very specific. Um, Ravenloft honestly doesn't work too well for a, a whole campaign. It's more designed for a couple of sessions where the players get sucked into Ravenloft to try to figure out how the hell to get out because it's a that's a bad place to be. Ravenloft is awesome. Well, yeah, it's great for a couple of stories, but uh, no, no, no. no. It, I live in Ravenloft. It's awesome. No, you don't, Eric. No, I don't. <laughs> there are no vampires where I live. Thank God. We killed and ate them all. <laughs> so, uh, but what are some other um, other disadvantages you can think of from the player's point of view, Eric? Um, well, there's always arguing with the game master. That's always a fun pastime. <laughs> but, um, yeah, if you... You can know exactly as much or as little as your character actually does about the game world, which is a huge help. There's no going, I know the answer, but my character wouldn't kind of deal. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they're, they're, yeah. So what are some of the drawbacks is what I meant to ask, actually? <laughs> okay. My bad. Some of the drawbacks are that, uh, well, some concepts just don't work terribly well in, in some game worlds. Like, say... Ravenloft, for example, we'll continue using this analog. Um, the the holy the the super holy good guy paladin is going to go insane in Ravenloft. Well, he's also got the giant. He's also got a giant. Uh, he, if I remember correctly, a giant target on his head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right, but even even discounting the uh, the fact that everything in the world wants to kill him, including the villagers he's trying to help, he's going to go nuts because it's so injustice and. and and horror is so prevalent there, he's going to just burn himself ragged if you play him correctly. Yep. Although I could see you actually wanting to do that. 
I I would want to do that because it would be fun. <laughs> <laughs> you like you like you like Doom Tarot's. <laughs> what? You like Doom Tarot's, Eric? I, I like I like heroes and I like scumbags, and there's not much in between for me. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, there's that a scumbag in say I can't think of a really goodness and light game world because I'm a bad person like bad things. <laughs> well, sir, so, you know, playing your playing, you know, like if there if you could think of a fairly tip, like I I can't think of one off the top of my head, but if there was a you know very sort of golden age uh, superhero game world that was that was out there. Playing, oh, that would drive me nuts. Right, Are playing you as you what playing as sort of a classic Iron Age gritty hero would work yes. really poorly. Oh yeah, it's it's not going to work. <laughs> yeah. Uh you you have serious culture clash. The other big problem with uh, with sort of your know, pre-made campaign worlds is uh the cost actually, monetary. Yes. Uh because you're going to want to buy a bunch you know, there's the basic book, but that won't have everything you want in it usually because the game companies are smart and want to make money. So they'll publish other sure. other books that'll have more information in them. Although I'm just gonna plug Privateer Press briefly here, although they're no longer publishing them, the um, the game worlds for their Iron Kingdoms, uh, the the two big books of Iron Kingdoms games, were originally going to be one, but they split them up because it would have been a giant Gutenberg Bible otherwise. Right. Yeah, there's some there are several companies that don't publish huge amounts of splat books for them, and then there's White Wolf, um, and then there's White Wolf, who do the opposite, um, and have boatloads yeah, of books. TSR. Of, yeah, T- oh, TSR does every. Yeah, all the big companies do it because they've got the press to do it, the printing presses to do it, and you know they've got the. I guess uh, they've got the the backing of their fans. I mean, and their fans yeah. will buy the you books anyway. Without a lot of fans. But you know the pre pre made pre made campaign worlds, the money can add up, um, and that can be a concern. Plus, it, you know, it's a lot of books to have. You know, t- taking up shelf space and. A lot of stuff that you have to go through to look look up certain details. So while it saves and time, it largely can... it's a, a burden. It's assumed to be a burden on the DM. Yeah, I mean, good players will pick that stuff up because it's cool, or you'll just do it without. But uh, I wouldn't just say good players, but there are players who do it because they want the stuff. Yeah. Because it's cool. Yeah. If you're playing a game world you're like, you'll probably end up picking up a bunch of the splat books because they're cool. Yep. So yeah, there's that. That it. That's one. That's another one of those little drawbacks. Um, <laughs> Riot Plains walking in the chat says, eventually you build the desk out of your rule books. I've done this. <laughs> I probably could. Uh, <laughs> in fact, uh, my current nightstand next to my bed is consisted entirely of RPG books <laughs> and 40k and fantasy army books. <laughs> Damn. So yeah. Um. Yeah, so those are some of the sort of classic drawbacks to them. Um, again, it's also, you know, if you're someone like me who um, I I like designing campaign worlds because that's sort of the way, one of my favorite things about game mastering is actually doing doing that sort of design work. I don't get a lot out of pre-gen campaign worlds for the most part. I mean, there are some that are, that's, it's good for, and I'm, okay, I'm happy doing it. But um, I really do like writing my own campaign worlds, so... It it's not so much it's it's not that it really stifles my, my creativity. It's more that it's just a little a little something I I don't get to do. So for some game masters, right. it's not something that you'll need not you'll not something you'll want to do because it's not really what you need. And that's the other thing um, when building your own uh, campaign world, you get to tailor it to exactly what you want, um, what your players might enjoy if that's a concern. I know it's not for all game masters. I know you guys are out there. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean that's the other thing is that not all campaign worlds will work for all groups. This is true. Um, and for some groups, you know, the mass quantities of detail that's available for them, uh, for some players, are, um, are is daunting. Because it's a lot of information to process. Uh, and some people are. And there, there are players out there. I know I used to be one of them that will hunt down and devour every bit of information about it about a game world they're playing in because they feel like they need to. Right. Uh, and that can actually be a detriment sometimes because they'll know the players will know more about the game world than the GM wants them to. Yes. And you know, if there's something that the GM says, ooh, this is a cool thing that would be cool to keep secret from the players and the players know it because it's been published and they have it. 
that can, you know, even if they're good at, you know, separating what their character knows from what they know, it, you it, still it, lose a little something there. Cause yep. you'll, you'll get the, assuming good players that are good about player knowledge and all that, you still lose some of the, oh shit, moment. Yep. Yeah, the, the penny dropping isn't quite as significant then. You sort of go from that one scene in Lord of the Rings where um, Frodo drops the ring and there's a loud thunk to dropping a quarter at the laundromat. Yeah. It's not quite as... It, it, it loses some of the impact is the big thing. So, um, yeah, that covers... I, I, I guess that pretty much covers most of the pros and cons of, of campaign worlds. I, 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 I'm much more, in many ways, much more comfortable with uh, pre-gen campaign roles than I'm with pre-gen adventures mm. um, mm-hmm. for several reasons. One, that I, 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 I it's, more, it's easier for me to see the, the benefits of uh, using a pre-gen world beyond saving yourself time. <laughs> right, um, because it, it, a lot of it is crowdsourced. Yep, exactly. Which means there's lots of stuff in there that one, just one person would think of. Right. It's a lot of people bouncing ideas off of one another's heads. Kind of like Super Bowls when you're really bored. <laughs> exactly. Um, so why don't we move on from that to pre-gen adventures? Okay. Which I think is a bit more interesting. Um, and so uh, why don't we start we off... Re- on. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll, so why don't we start off, Eric, what do you think the pros are from the player's point of view? The player's point of view? Yeah. Um... If it's done right, you won't even know the difference. Honestly. Um, seriously, like a, a good GM, you won't even know the difference between one he's cooked up and one that he's he bought on the sh- off the shelf or downloaded or something. Right. Yeah. Um, um, so yeah. the pros the pros are largely material in that a pre-gen adventure will typically have rewards built into it. So if you have a, a traditionally stingy GM, it's usually a, a giveaway when you start getting toys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the, from a GM's point of view, uh, pre-gen adventures, the big, big benefit, and this is, it's even more so than it is a pre-gen campaign world, is it, it's a time saver. Yes. Um, ideally, you're going to want to, you're going to, you're going to make some changes to it to, t- to tailor it to your group because um, every group is different. But uh, it still saves you time from actually writing the entire adventure ahead, ahead of time. I, and, I do remember exactly. I do remember several GMs uh, with uh, different groups I've been in going, I've had to rewrite every encounter in here because you guys are too smart. Stop being so smart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's not tuning my own horn. I wasn't the one being smart there. I just wanted to break stuff. <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> but yeah, no, um... It definitely does save time, um, and that can be a non-insignificant thing. Um, I, you know, I've I've used pre-gen adventures from time to time, just to, because it's like, oh crap! I, it's you know, it's it's Friday. I've got Friday. It's Friday night. I've got a game Saturday early in the afternoon. I'm not gonna have time to write up everything I want to write up. Uh, I've got this adventure here. I've not run with this group before. I'll make some tweaks to it and go. And that's, you know, it's, it's, it's a big time saver. Um, I, I've known uh, a couple DMs who uh, have yanked encounters straight out of modules um, when they run into stuff like that. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Um, also, you know, oftentimes, you know, pre adventures will have more details than that you might not have thought of as a game master to include. Mm. Um, because... You know they've they've had they've they've had time to write it and test it and added more details here and there and it's you know it's it, they've had more time. Again, to write. it's crowdsourcing. You, yep. you usually have two or three writers for one of these things. Yep. Um, and it's a it's a big plus. Um, I. The disadvantage is it's script writing by committee, <laughs> and that can be a big problem in my opinion. Um, yes. I as a game master, I'm not a big fan of a lot of pre-gen adventures, usually because. I have to tailor them so much to my group that um, in the end, I'm not really saving myself that much work. <laughs> uh, and and they're, they're usually very much written for the lowest common denominator. Yes. Uh, additionally, you know, there's... 
trying to think how to how to phrase this. I mean, it's I I like writing adventures as a thing. So I mean, I, from my right. point of view, I just there's so little benefit for me that I it's not. I mean, especially the ones you have to buy. It's like you know I don't see the it being worth my money. Uh, and oftentimes, a lot of them really aren't that well written. Uh, in my experience, I mean, there's some, there there are exceptions. Don't get me wrong. Uh, I've heard there are exceptions. I've heard um, really good things about um, uh, the the uh, the the various uh, adventure paths that Paizo's put out for Pathfinder. I've heard very good things about them. They're not cheap, but I've heard good that they're they're usually very well written. For for getting really old school, the Temporal element of Elemental Evil is pretty damn good. It is probably the single best balanced um, dungeon crawl that TSR ever put out. Yes. Uh, it is astonishing, astonishing how well built it is for a, basically a sort of a, a campaign, really, that's a, a campaign long dungeon crawl uh, that is really well balanced. There's an actual real story there. Um, and, you know, as, and it's designed to, you, you as you go down in the dungeon, uh, the challenge of the dungeon is, scales almost perfectly to the level your party is going to be at as you go through the dungeon. And it's, I mean, you read through... stupid and skip a bunch of stuff like we did. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes, you can get yourself killed if you know the right thing, know, know to do the quote right, end quote thing at the, wrong, at the right time. Um, <laughs> hey, we're, we've gone from the top of the dungeon to the bottom of the dungeon. We're level one, we're like level one and two, and oh god, we're gonna die. Don't do yeah. that, kids. Um, for an example, I, I actually recently played through it. Um, there is a shortcut in the Temple of Elemental Evil to go from the top to the bottom. We figured it out. We regretted this very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a classic it's a classic classic adventure a super adventure really for a reason. Um, and I mean, if I were to run it, I'd probably tweak it somewhat just so I could tweak I tw I wouldn't necessarily tweak the encounters. So much that I would tweak the you know the story to fit the players a little bit better, but mm. um, I did actually in inject more actual opportunities for RP and such. But it's you know the, it's someday I I keep talking about someday going through it and adapting it to fourth edition, but that'd be a lot of work. There'd be a lot of work, but it'd be it's pretty brilliant. <laughs> is it's, it's, is it's big. I mean, it's really big. I mean, it's designed to get you from level one to level seven. Yeah. So um, it, it would be pretty brilliant, though. Yeah, so I'm I, just thinking about the amount of maps you'd have to draw. Oh forward. God, the pain! <laughs> but yeah, um, again, and so another sort of drawback from the, I mean, most there aren't a lot of drawbacks to the adventures from the player's point of view, um, I, in my opinion, to pre-gen adventures outside of the one of the effect it has in the game master, um, right? Primarily things like, uh, you know. Oftentimes, players will, you know, come up with questions that the module didn't anticipate. And, you know, the GM's going to sit there going, oh, I, I have to make something up the fly that will tie into the rest of the adventure. And, right. I, and I, it, it either will lead the GM to have to rewrite more of the adventure, or they'll have it to... It will ring hollow. It will ring hollow, or it just won't work. Um, and, and additionally, as you mentioned, you know, the things where the players come up with something clever that breaks the adventure, you know, that'll cut them ahead yep. far too far. Uh, you'll have to scramble to fix things on the fly. Um, and I, it's, and again, I, 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 I can't stress enough. I don't, I just don't, for a sufficiently experienced GM, I don't see them as really necessary. Uh, they are great for new, newer GMs. Don't, do not get me wrong. They are absolutely brilliant for for inexperienced gms or just lazy ones like me and, uh, <laughs> and again you'll run into different quality of of um different quality of the adventures the, the it's gonna be a, it's it'll be a bit of a crapshoot is the thing um yeah oh, um i just thought of something from a, a detriment from a player's point of view yep. is that rarely will there be resting time for actual RP unless you make it happen. Yeah. Adventure. Yeah, a lot a lot of pre-published uh, uh, adventures are, 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 are dungeon crawls. Um, yes. And I talked about sort of the strengths and weaknesses of dungeon crawls in the first episode of Surly Grognards, which was with Jesse. But um, 
you know, dungeon crawls have strengths and weaknesses, and not all pre pre uh, pre designed pre made adventures are dungeon crawls. Uh, I can think of a few. There are a few that I've run over the years that aren't. Um, um I can think of one I played in that was actually a uh, a political mystery that you didn't realize was a political mystery until three quarters of the way through when you're starting to put the the things together, the clues together. Right. That's cool. Uh, it, was and, actually, it was actually a shadow run. Shatter Run uh, module. I forget the name of it. Yeah, it was actually really cool. That's awesome. No, there are a lot of really good pre pre-made adventures out there, um, and there are a lot of really bad ones. I mean, it, Sturge's like anything else, ninety percent of them is going to be crap. Yeah, Sturge's law applies. <laughs> ninety percent of everything is crap. Uh, so yeah, I I, I definitely see there are definitely uses for GMs, and you can do some really interesting things with um, with a pre-gen adventure. Uh, especially if it's a pretty good adventure for a more open system like GURPS or, or Hero and what, where you could take the adventure as written and completely change the genre it's in. Yes. Um, I have taken um, you know, the adventure idea and the NPC's personalities and motivations and the actual story of a Star Wars adventure and adapted it to a, uh, to a fantasy game on more than one occasion. Um, and vice versa. Uh, That's actually not hard to do, and kind of awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Thinking about it. <laughs> um, and, you know, there, as always, I mean, as I've talked about before, you know, stealing ideas from various stories uh, when we were talking about making your own adventures last time. Um, like, you know, the prime example is I have uh, taken the basic core of the story of uh, the Maltese Falcon. I've run it in about three different type genres of uh, RPGs. I've run it using feng shui, I've run it in a Star Wars game, uh, and I've run it in a sort of traditional fantasy game, uh, because the Maltese Falcon is a fucking awesome story. <laughs> it is. <laughs> now, um, in, when I was playing first edition D&D uh, a few months back, there was a short-lived campaign in that it wasn't one of those like decades-long things that you occasionally hear about. Right. Um, but it did last several months. But what the GM did was... He basically built his own game world, and it was actually a, a pretty, pretty well detailed, pretty impressive game world. But was running entire all the adventures were entirely um, old D and D modules that he actually managed to link together by being insane, from what I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and had it all make sense. Yep. <laughs> Right now, um, we are, I mean, the, like the, uh, my Thursday night game, we are doing basically the same thing. We're playing through a bunch of basic, basic D&D modules that uh, my friend Peter Shaw has. He's got a huge collection of basic Dungeons and Dragons modules uh, and old uh, Dragon magazines and such. That we, um, we, you know, we, we, he's taken those adventures. Uh, you know, we started with uh, Keep on the Borderlands and we, you know, uh, Went to the Palace of Silver Princess after that. And these are old, old, classic basic Dungeons & Dragons modules. And he's found a way to link them into a big overarching story. And it's been kind of cool. Um, it's got some flaws. It, the the pre-gen adventures aren't really the flaw of it. It's more that we're doing second edition D&D, and I'm really not a big fan of that system anymore. Um, I loved it when I was younger because, you know, it was what everyone was playing. And at the time, I hadn't experienced other game systems. Many well, it's not true. I'd experience other game systems, but they're all very similar. Um, Dungeons and Dragons and First Edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons are great game systems if you've never encountered anything else. Yeah, uh, and they're not. They're they're still. It still can be fun. It's just that like I'm used to seeing more modern concepts on the mechan the way math the math of the game works. Right. Um. I I will say that um. I have I've never actually played basic D and D, but First Edition D and D really grates on me. And um, I can't really put my finger on what it was, but like, while playing with, with that, that group in the, the first D&D &D game, where he had his own world but was running modules, um, was fun because I was with my, my playing with friends and it was all really well done. It, the system really grated on my nerves. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm sort of in a similar position with the, my Thursday night game. I and mean, we're all friends and I, that's the reason I play with them. And it's a nice that I'm, you know, playing and not running the game. Mm. But uh, 
it's, it, both first and second edition D and D, AD and D, sort of great on me a bit, a fair bit. Uh, sort of the underlying math second of actually great on me more than first, but hmm. the underlying math of the game is part of the problem. Um, I don't want to get too deeply into this today, but I I was running through the numbers, and you know, at level, you know, it, 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 you're to hit the base. So you're assume that you're going to get you're t- you're going to hit a pro. It worked out. That sort of an average, you know, melee combatant is going to hit the uh, sort of an even level monster, maybe thirty five percent of the time. Yeah, about a third of the time. And it's astonishing uh, it, how how inaccurate you feel. Is it yeah. feels like you're hitting less often than that because it's so streaky at that point. Um and. Back, you know, and the most game systems these days assume you're going to be hitting a little bit more than 50% of the time, at least. You, I, I found more closer to 60, usually. Yeah. But. So, you know, and especially after having played games like Hero System and, and, uh, and GURPS, where you're assumed to hit number is going to be, where you're oftentimes going to be hit, like you're making your attack skill checks like 90% of the time. Now there'll be things that'll reduce your odds of actually hitting, but um, so yeah, it's it's the math ends up feeling a bit sort of off. Um, and again, it's it's not so much. I think it's because it grew out of uh, a war game uh, where you know if you've got a bunch of guys attacking and have a thirty three percent chance of hitting, it doesn't feel as it doesn't feel as bad, right? Because you're you're rolling a fistful of dice. Right, exactly. Although, to be fair, most war games assume 50% also. Yeah. Um, uh, assuming equally skilled combatants. Yeah, I, there's also the fact that I think the to hit numbers in 2nd in edition also assume that you have better stats than you are likely to roll. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and if you were playing with a pure point-by system where you could actually get your strength up to a, you know, a bit where you're getting a bonus to hit from it, you're more likely to pull things off. So, I don't know, it's... It's, it's interesting. Um, Amusingly, uh, to continue on tangents um, from the actual... Yeah, that's fine. Um, I've actually recently come to the conclusion that I vastly prefer point by systems to rolling your dice. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and this is this is from an old vet. I've been playing games since I was friggin' 12. Right. And, yeah, it took me this long to figure it out. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I've been, I, I started out even earlier than you did, and I think for me, part of the reason I, all of a sudden, got into point, you know, doing point by for stats in D and D, and thought it was a much better system, is because I discovered GURP so early on in my career, my sort of my gaming career. Mm. So I got used to, you know, not just you know buying your stats, but buying everything, mm. and playing with playing a system where the classes don't exist. You just pick what abilities you want. And I, I, I found, you know, that um, I find classes to be limiting, <laughs> <laughs> let alone, you know, um, uh, let alone buy, you know, buying not ran, randomly generated stats. I, I find that very frustrating that, you know, I can't necessarily make the character I want to make. Right. Now, there are um, times that it works out okay. Um, I think it works better in some systems than others. Uh, right. The random generation systems with, that have things like life paths, that actually tends to work better in my experience because while it's random, you can actually yes. see the character grow and you can start putting things together in your head. Um, so, yeah, like, yeah. Um, you know, or some of the life path stuff. Um, some of it is just so random and bizarre. Um, I immediately think of Traveler. Um, well, there's, there's a, bit of tr- for a bit of choice in Traveler, too. So There's a fair amount of choice, but there's also the, oh, you're dead. Well, but you, I haven't played the first session. Well, yeah, you, you're dead. Start you again. can't die in Traveler anymore, the new edition of it, so... Oh, you can't, okay. Well, yeah, it, it's almost impossible, I think, but... it, it Yeah. At any rate, um, actually, interestingly enough, that sort of talk about sort of the lack of choice and the sort of, you know, I find, finding sort of the... the I, find, I find, you know, character classes and things like that a bit stifling, I think explains part of the reason why I don't like pre-gen adventures mm. is... I can't design it exactly the way I want to. That's... I, I can totally see that. Now, conversely, um, I kind of like classes. And even in a completely free system, I'll usually gravitate towards a particular class 
archetype. Yeah, sure. Call him a call it a class, call it a career, call, call it an it archetype, role, whatever. Yeah, etc. Oh, there are plenty of game systems that have those that I, I'm perfectly fine with, and I mean, I, I like fourth edition. Um, and the classes in that are, it's even more limited in most ways than 3rd edition, where you could basically take various levels and various classes to effectively build your own class. Now, does it work as well as they want it to work? But, <laughs> um, the idea is that, and I think it's kind of cool. And I think they got it pretty right in, uh, D20 Modern with sort of the generic classes they had, you know, smart hero, quick hero, strong hero, and tough hero. Mm. And you basically, you basically, as you leveled up, you could take levels in each of those, and that affected what you could do later on. That's interesting. I never actually played D20 Modern. I've never played it either. I've just, I own a copy of it. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but I thought it was an interesting idea. Um, but yeah, um, that's one of the things I do find a little bit limiting about, um, about, it, about pre-gen adventures and pre-gen campaign worlds is that, is that I, I, I tend to like, I mean, I improv a lot, as you know, Eric, uh, when <laughs> I game master, um, you can probably tell. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Everything's according to a plan, right? <laughs> no, not even remotely. <laughs> so yeah, I, and occasionally that'll bite me in the ass, but um, and it does from time to time. I admit that, but I it's sort of the way it's it's what I enjoy most about game mastering, and I can do less of that in a pre-gen adventure. So that's sort of my my main my main sort of you know main sort of, uh, I guess, drawback to them is they do tend to be somewhat stifling creativity in terms of creativity for you, for the Game Master. Now, if that's not really your big thing, it's your big thing as a Game Master is running the encounters, playing the NPCs, and linking the adventures together in your own, into a big story, pre-gen adventures can be fantastic. Um, the only other drawback at that point is, much like the uh, for you know, pre-gen adventure, pre-gen pre -gen campaign worlds, is the cost. You're going to be buying a bunch of modules. Um, it's true. You are or pirating them, but we would never support yeah. that. And I, and I actually mean that. I actually, yeah, I agree. I, if it's worth if it's worth pirating, it's usually worth buying, unless you can't find it. Right. I, I really do feel that if uh, if you can if you can buy it, it's worth doing it. Uh, it's, support the support the people actually making this stuff seriously. Uh, because they now, they don't make a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, if it doesn't exist anymore, if it's not being published anymore, and you can't find it. That's another matter entirely. Yep. But go to your go to your friendly neighborhood game store and buy the shit. <sighs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that basically. So I guess we can sort of sort of sum up the uh, strengths and weaknesses of both things here. Just you know, you know, the strengths of a pre-gen campaign world are that you know it saves the GM time. Uh, there's a host of information for both the GM and the player to reference, uh, to build their own camp, build their campaign, and for the player to build their characters off of. Um, and there's, it gives sort of depth of the world that you pr might not get in a campaign world of your own devising. And there's tons of detail to reference, so that's big. The drawbacks to yes. it uh, are that it'll cost you, it costs money. Um, uh, it'll be, it'll limit your, limit your own what you can do in it, on your own. It might not, the various campaigns might not work for the various groups. Um, and the level of detail that's available can be daunting to some people. Um, similarly, with adventures, uh, the pros are again it saves the GM a lot of time, um, and that's that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, yeah. And again, it gives the it, there's going to be details there the GM wouldn't have thought of, and that can add a certain level of verisimilitude for the players. Um, and again, in the hands of a skilled DM, it's hard to tell the difference. Um, it's it's really if he knows what he's doing, you're never going to notice. And again, um, the drawbacks to that are, you know, very, are ba very basically, you know, the play, it's cost the gym. Again, it's going to cost you money. Um, it's gonna, it, it limits your what you can do creativity in terms of creative writing and such. And those are really the two big cons. I mean, there really are. I mean, it, there aren't. A, and again, oh, the other con is it the it, there's a really mixed level of quality in the adventures out there. And they always, always assume lowest common denominator because they kind of have to. Right. I mean, they're, they're being produced for the mass market, as mass market as RPGs are. Yep. Um, so, <laughs> if you have a really bright group, they're going to break the adventure pretty quickly. And uh, plan for that. If you have a really dumb group, they're never going to get anywhere. 
Right. So uh, I think that covers the bit, sort of uh, primary strengths and weaknesses. You got anything else you can think of, Eric, that you want to talk about um, on the topic? Honestly, on the rare occasion where I decide to actually run a game, um, I'm not a GM. I, I do not enjoy it, but I will do it occasionally. Um, I vastly prefer having a, a preset world to, to pull stuff from because it, it's like a... It's it's like a, a a garden of stuff. I can go in and I can pick stuff out, and I have a an already set tone to, to worry about, and I can change the tone as I like, as long as it fits within the flavor of it. Right. But when it comes to actually running a campaign out of, um, I typically don't touch modules and pre-made uh, adventures. I, I'll usually make them up as I go along. Um, very less improvisational than you are, but. Yeah, I, I usually don't have things planned more than three or four sessions ahead of time. Right. Yeah, and honestly, I think that's a, I I think that's a, a good mix for um for 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 new GMs especially, uh, mm. for newer GMs. It's basically, you know, buying starting off with a pre pre created campaign because that saves you time, campaign world, uh, and it gives you a lot of details to pull stuff from. And then you buy maybe one or two modules, um, to start things off with, um, and then build out from there. Uh, and so again, sort of starting, sort of start small, except that you have something big that you don't have that you can draw from, without having to, you know, start there. Now, the uh, doing the opposite, like um, like my friend Mike, who was during the first head D and D game I was talking about, um, did. I, I honestly wouldn't have thought of, but it worked really well. And, and, and yeah, it was it was actually fairly impressive. They managed to tie all these disparate uh, adventures together into an actual overarching campaign. Yep. And that's not something, that's not an easy thing to do, but it can be actually very satisfying if you can pull it off. Mm. Um, and I applaud Mike for doing that. I'm applauding my friend Peter Shaw, who's been doing that uh, on Thursdays from our group uh, on that also. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, and it's, it's very cool. So I think that covers the, the basic topic for the, uh, for the week. So I think it's time to move on to questions and answers. What do you think, Eric? I think we can do this thing. Excellent. Uh, we're going to start off with an email that we received. We received an email! Holy crap! It's the end of everything. The free world is doomed. All right, We this... were noticed by someone. All right, this is from Andrew Henderson. Uh, he writes, I'm going off to college in a few weeks, and I've never played an R in an RPG in person. Only a few play-by-post uh, and Skype games. Uh, but I've got a bunch of books from yard sales as pr and as presents, and occasionally actually buying one from brick-and-mortar store. I want to organize a game in college, but I don't want to default to the DM if I can't help it, since I don't think I'd be all that good at the work that DMing entails, such as a new as su as such a new player. So, how would you advise me to to gather a group together, but not default to DMing? Note, I want to advice on both how to gather a group and how not to, how not to default to DMing. Um, well, for starters, uh, getting a group together is uh, especially once you get to college, is uh. It's a lot easier once you hit college. Yeah. Um, now, a lot of colleges will have uh, community boards. So putting up something there, um, whether it be electronic or physical, saying, looking for group for this game. Um, have many books, blah, blah, blah. Well, usually net something, though not you won't be able to... Have... The quality of the group will be completely up in the air. Yeah. You know, and, you know, talk to people. Find people you actually gravitate towards. Um, and if any of them are, if any of them are people who are interested in, game, in uh, playing, uh, playing RPGs, you'll probably eventually get a game together. Um, but, yep. yeah, I honestly, uh, the, when I got to college, the first game, I, uh, first D&D &D game, first uh, RPG I played in uh, was because was, uh, I was at the, uh, the bookstore, the college bookstore. And they had a few, they had a very small selection of RPG stuff there. And I happened to stand by there, sort of thumbing through it, and one of the other guys walked by, and whom I'd met during orientation. This was my freshman year. And he said, oh, you play, uh, you, you play RPGs? I said, yeah. Uh, so he said, do you play d and I'm like, yeah. Well, I've got a couple people getting a game together. You'd be interested in playing? I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> and so that I got into that game. We, that game didn't last very long, but I got to know all the people in the group, and they formed sort of the core of the RPG groups that I ended up playing in in, in college. Uh, them and various people I got to know just randomly, um, and some of them ended up being, you know, the people I ended up getting to know were fellow nerds and geeks like me. <laughs> and so most of us ended up, you know, we were all a mix of computer gamers and tabletop gamers of various sorts, and we, 
you know, we played we played a bunch of different RPGs. Uh, I ended up DMing a lot because uh, I'm the guy who ends up DMing a lot. But you know, you have to you have to take, take it'll take some patience sometimes. But uh, you know, literally take advantage of the resource there. If there's a community board of some sort. You know, make put a post up, put you know, put a note up. Uh, if it's if it's if it's a, you know an e electronic board, put a post up there saying you know player looking for an RPG, list the game the game systems you know and prefer, um, and say that you prefer to be a player. Um, and in general, it's uh, you'll eventually find you will eventually find a group in college uh, because most colleges are swimming with them. They, it's really astonishing. Um, um, now. Amusingly, my college experience when it came to role-playing games is entirely different. Because so I went to an, art, to an art school, which means you can imagine the degree of ego involved and <laughs> the amount of, I can't admit that I play RPGs. Uh, th those are so plebeian. But eventually, after getting to know and getting several people drunk enough, I realized that, yes, they also played games and ended up in several groups. Many of the people I still play with, uh, I've met either... Um, in college or through people um, at college. So um, another advantage is if there's a brick and mortar uh, game store, and there usually will be one in a college town. Yep. Um, all this is becoming less and less true lately. Uh, go there and hang out. Honestly, you'll meet people there. Um, you'll meet the worst examples of the gamer stereotype, and you'll meet some really cool people. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, basically, you know, just don't be afraid to talk to people about games uh, is the long and short of it, in all honesty. Uh, you know, talk to people in the computer labs, you know, um, <laughs> you know, things like that. Get to know people on your in, on your dorm floor. Uh, someone there might be a gamer. <laughs> like and, book shelves when at parties. Do you see a D&D &D book? Do you see a 40K army? <laughs> exactly. You know, things like that. You know, get to know, just get to know people and, uh, and, uh, don't be afraid to admit you're a gamer. Uh, in college, it's much less of a stigma than it was in high school. Absolutely. <laughs> because there are, it's, you know, there are more, people tend to be more tolerant of hobbies in college, I found. I'm not sure why, but it is. It's true. Uh, and, yeah, the, the, if there's a local game store, go down there, hang out. Um, and, and, and trust me, at the local game store, you will meet the full gamut mm -hmm. from the well-to-do professional man who also plays Dungeons and Dragons to the sad wreck of a human being living out of his car because his parents kicked him out of his man cave. Right. Uh, so, yeah, um, I, I think that's, that, that's our advice there is, you know, just uh, take advantage of what, what opportunities there are to get information out there. as not being the, uh, the default DM, um, hang out with Mecha GM. He'll do it for you. <laughs> God damn you, Eric. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> I know. I know. Yeah, that's the other trick: is find the guy who DMs all the time and hang out with him. He'll end up running the game, running games ninety percent of the time. Usually, because <sighs> he actually enjoys it. Yeah, I do. For everyone. That's the thing is, if it's and the other thing is, don't be afraid to DM a couple of times. But you know, if it's not something you really enjoy uh, and it's not something you're good at, just make that clear to the other people in your group that you're not. It, you're just not good. It's not your thing. They'll usually, uh, they'll usually be accepting. Yeah, and you will probably be dragooned into doing it once or twice. All players are. Yeah. So. All right. Uh, so let's go to the chat for questions. I hope I think I hope that answered your question there. Uh, oh, what was his name again? Uh, it was hope that answers Andrew. Your questions, Mr. Email. Uh, that, I hope that answered your question, a Andrew. Um, so let's uh, go over to the chat here. It looks like we had a question from Sam Honey. Uh, have I ever had a game where instead of building a large world, I focus everything inside of one small area beside a dungeon? For example, a group of survivors or minorities trying to escape a city built against them. Yes, Sam, honey. Uh, those kit, I've played several. I've run one or two games where it's been centered entirely into one city, um, or just a, you know a village in the surrounding areas. Uh, it's a great way to start as a game master because, again, I, as I suggest, I said last week, start small. And it's. Um. Uh, for an example, all I have to do is point at, at Shadowrun. Ninety percent of the the content for Shadowrun revolves around Seattle. Yep. So yeah, um, and I've run I've run sci-fi games that were, took place entirely on one space station. Um, you know, just look at Babylon Five. The vast majority of Babylon Five takes place on Bab Five itself. It's, it, it's true. Uh, I mean, there are plenty. You could run an entire game that takes place in the same building. Yep. 
um, a Call of Cthulhu campaign, which are by necessity short relived, can take place entirely in the same apartment building. Yep. Um, and as usual, when I when I when I give out these sort of tips, the, 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 these sort of tips, assume it's sort of a general tip. It's not a hard and fast rule. Um, just a one thing to sort of say. Everything I say is truth, and it should be taken as gospel. Uh, Eric is lying. Uh, <laughs> I am. All right, so any other questions from the chat here? Uh, oh, here we go. Another one from Isle Snake. How is a DM or a player? Do you balance between fighting and acting in character during combat and playing the most optimal way the rules allow? Um, as a DM, this is mostly your question, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in here and say that uh, when you have the all goodness and light and rainbows and happiness paladin, murdering, surrendering uh, opponents, you're allowed to come in and say, dude, that's not cool. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is, um, playing. Them, there doesn't have to be a conflict between acting in character and playing in the most optimal way the rules allow. Um, similarly, there is, there isn't, a, doesn't have to be a dichotomy between combat and role-playing. Um, it's true. Uh, you can do a lot of role playing and storytelling during during a fight. Um, there are many times where I've been playing a, a character who is, let's say, not intelligent or too proud for certain things that will make a tactically egregious error because a he's dumb, and I know I'm making a tactically egregious error, or b he's way too proud to do or, or honorable to take the obvious cheap shot. Right. Um, and it's not just that either. I mean, uh, I can think of a prime example from the movies, actually, um, of that of you know, sort of ro effectively role playing during combat. Uh, there's a uh, the movie The Iron Monkey. It's a martial arts movie, um, and one of my favorites. Uh, there are several fights between two of the ma main characters, uh, uh, Wong Kei Yin and the Iron Monkey, um, where they're discuss they're fighting and discussing their relative morals and why they're doing what they do during the fight. And it's a great example of, you know, explaining, um, exp sort of actually do storytelling during the fight. And additionally, it's also a great example of ex sort of demonstrating the conflict, the potential conflict between a lawful good character and a chaotic good character. Mm. <laughs> because the Iron Monkey is basically Zoro, and Wong Kei Yin is a, a very prime, a very prime example of a lawful good guy, who's been ro roped in by the the local despotic governor to deal with the Iron Monkey, who's been stealing from him. Because you know, stealing is wrong, and eventually they end up fighting alongside each other when you know the evil bad guys become truly evil, and the in the and you know Wong Kei Yin couldn't, can't take it anymore. But it's a, it's a great example of both those things. So I, I it, it don't there there doesn't have to be a dichotomy. Watch a show in an anime. They do it all the time. The good ones, yes. It, it's a yeah. The good ones do. <laughs> the, the bad ones will basically just be Goku screaming at the screen while turning blonde for half an hour. And, and Dragon Ball Z has some good has some good stuff in there too. Actually, it's it, just... it's, it's true. But Dragon Ball Z is also very much um, indicative of all the things I dislike about anime. <laughs> well, say Cowboy Bebop is everything I love about anime. So... Yep. All right, uh, Gearwan has a question. Planning on jamming later this year, and I'm making a game world from scratch. I have the general layout for the world itself and the lore, yet I have a feeling that it will be somewhat bland for the first few parts I have laid out. Any tips on how to get a large story started easily in a campaign setting? Um, well, uh, as I said, uh, start small. Uh, don't start the story out big. You know, focus on small, like, small conflicts, and then build out from there. Don't do what I did, which is take something giant and horrible and throw it at the players right away in hopes that it would make them unify. Because all it did was make them feel tiny and insignificant, and they ended up killing one another in the end. <laughs> no! But yeah, so in, like, in that sort of game world, you've got all these details. You don't have to use them all immediately. Um, and just start off with, like, you know, defending a village from bandits. That'll get the yeah. that'll get the players together. Seven Samurai, one of the greatest movies ever made. That's a great one. Oh my god, that's a great way to the start. The Seven Samurai is another story that will adapt to almost any genre. Absolutely, uh, it's been adapted um, to several different genres in film with varying degrees of success. Um, 
<laughs> you know, The Seven Samurai is a great what movie. Is battle? Oh, what is the name? Battle of Beyond the, the Stars is what you're thinking ship. of. Yes. The one of the tit ship. Yeah. That, that was Seven Samurai in Space. <laughs> That's Seven Samurai in Space. The Magnificent Seven. Seven Samurai in the Wild West. Which is funny because Seven Samurai was Akira Kurosawa saying, let's see, can I make a Western in, in feudal Japan? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Westerns and Samurai movies steal from each other all the time. They do. There, there are a lot of thematic links. So, uh, yeah, uh, my, my advice for Gear 1 is start, start off with a small story and build out from there. Uh, and that'll give you time to fill in more details around it also. So, you know, and the other thing you have to remember is uh, the core of, the, there are very few, uh, if you boil a story down to its core, there are, there are basically three stories. Um, uh, it was actually Heinlein who said this. I quoted it as being Joseph Campbell an uh, episode or two back, and I was wrong. It's actually Heinlein who said it. Um, he said basically there are two stories, um, uh, Boy Meets Girl and Little Taylor. Uh, and then I believe it was uh, Elron Hubbard who basically corrected him and said, there's also a man learns a lesson. Um, and con if you take the converses of those, uh, you know, a boy doesn't meet girl, you know, boy and girl don't get together. Uh, the opposite little tale, which I forget what that is. Uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you telling me the man that wrote Battlefield Earth said something intelligent? The man who wrote Battlefield Earth wrote it on a, on, on, as a bet, Eric. I know, I know. Battlefield Earth was written as a... Yeah, the man who founded Scientology is... <laughs> yeah, I, I know, I know. It's just... My, I, Wow. <laughs> he said something really profound, and I'm... My world is... is broken now. I need to find a way to stitch Well, it was Highland who said the most, the more profound part of that, so... That's true. So you can take comfort in that. Still, Hubbard said something intelligent. Yeah. I, I need mechs. I need mechs to stitch my world back together. All right. Pathos35 has a question. Uh, I think this might be our last one for the night. Uh, his, in his friend's game, he rolled up a character that is really, really strong, but I ran it before the GM beforehand, gave him all the stats, how much damage he can do, all the skills, etc., and he proved it. When he actually runs the game, though, my guy starts tearing through his opposition, and now he wants me to roll up a new character. So Sharp, roll up a new one, or ask him to increase the difficulty since he completely and totally greenlit your character. Uh, my personal take on that pathos is see if you can work with the GM to find a way to scale your character back if you really like the character. Um, yeah, um, I, it's easy enough to scale the guy out, even story-wise, just... Just, pair, just pair. I don't know, have him get caught in a plasma blast, or some orc manages to shiv him in the kidney, and he has let lingering effects afterwards. Or even, you, you, know, you don't have to do that, just, you know, don't necessarily even have to explain it, just dial it back a little, dial it back the math a little bit on him. Uh, I, that's where I would, I would recommend starting there, although if you don't think you can do that without really harming the core of the character, um, I would recommend making a new character that fits in balance-wise better because upping the difficulty on all the opposition will unfortunately have the effect of making things much harder on the rest of the group. Uh, that is actually, I think, more of a problem than you being too powerful for the, what you're fighting. Yeah, the, the problem is more that uh, you're outclassing the rest of the PCs. And um, having been a character uh, that was outclassed by PC, other PCs, um, that's not so much fun. And being the guy that, having also been the guy that ever, that outclasses the PCs, that's equally not as much fun in the long run. So, yeah, At I, least for me. I would, I would try to find a way to dial yourself back and not, uh, dial yourself up. Uh, dial the opposition up. That's, that'd be my preference, personally. Um, just want to give a shout out to, uh, Rolo T, who's here in the chat. Hey, dude. <laughs> One of the players in my Thursday night, in my, uh, Sunday game. <laughs> Um, Hello, guy in game. I'm not in. <laughs> so I think that will cover uh, cover the questions for tonight. Um, guy, anything else you want to say, Eric? Um, I drank too much. <laughs> I'm shocked, Eric. I know. I mean, it's amazing. It's not like it doesn't happen every week we do this. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I guess that's all the time we have for today. Uh, if you've got comments on the show or would like to post your question, have your questions answered during the, during the question and answer portion of the show, question and answer part of the, part of the show, uh, please feel free to either comment on the blog post uh, where you find the recording of this or send an email to our email address, surlygrognards at yahoo.com. Uh, that's surlygrognards, all one word, at yahoo.com. And we'll try to get your questions in a future show. Uh, you Holy can crap, Dan, you spawned? <laughs> 
Well, you can find uh, find me on Twitter at MechaGM or on Facebook or Google as Peter Bowman. You can find Eric's work on the webcomic Boston Arcanum, which is located at bostonarcanum, all one word, dot com. Uh, I'm Peter Bowman, and for my co-host, Eric Carlson, Carlson, I wish you all a good night and hope you enjoy the show. Say good night, Eric. Good night, Eric. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry the vaudeville called. <laughs>